In this video, we're going to be talking about the basic operations and controls of the Canon R50. We're gonna talk about what these icons mean. I will teach you how to use the touchscreen to operate your camera. We will cover topics such as focus control, exposure control, ISO, white balance, metering, and all of the other basic operations of the camera. My name is Michael Andrew, and I'm going to be your host and instructor for about the next one and a half to two hours. Let me say congratulations on purchasing such an awesome camera. The R50 is really the upgrade from the M50 and the M50 Mark II, which was one of the highest selling Canon cameras for beginners in the last couple of years. My training video on the M50, there's like 2 million views. So I know this is a very popular camera. This video brought to you by Maven Filters. This is a filter line that I designed. I'm very proud of it. At some point in your photography career, you're going to want to get filters. Maven Filters, in my opinion, there's nothing better on the planet. If this is your first camera, I would definitely recommend watching this video from start to finish. If you're an experienced photographer or you're reviewing the lessons or this isn't your first rodeo, I would strongly recommend using the table of contents. We've spent a lot of time putting this together and the way that works is you're going to hit Control F or Command F, type in the subject matter that you're interested in, do a search, and if we have a chapter marker for it, there'll be some time code there, you can click on it and it will jump you to that lesson. It's a very powerful reference, like a video reference tool. For those of you who are beginning and intermediate photographers, I have to give you a word of warning. This video, will not be enough for you to take consistently great images. You could probably get lucky, but you may not really understand what you're doing. To become a consistently great photographer, there are skill sets that you will need to combine with what you learn here, and without those skill sets, you will be very limited. I'm talking about things such as your basic photography core, things like shutter speed and aperture, depth of field. Then we have the artistic side, which is called composition. This is how you frame your subjects in your viewfinder to make it aesthetically pleasing. And then we talk about lighting. This is something else you're going to, lighting is critically important for a photographer and you'll need to know how to use those things in combination with the camera. And to make it even harder is that different genres of photography require different skill sets. For example, the lessons I would teach to a wildlife photographer would be very different than the skill sets I'm teaching to a sports photographer. Now, the reason I say this is because based on the amount of people who watch this video, like it, and let us know that you're interested, I will make a crash course on the Canon R50. This would be an advanced crash course. I will teach you all those basics and I will show you how to put them together. When I got started, it took me two years of trial and error. And I was very frustrated one day. I almost threw my camera into a wall because I knew in my mind what I wanted to do, but I couldn't do it with the camera. It was very frustrating, and I can relate to you if this is how you feel. Let me make it easy for you. If you are interested in a crash course, check the link in the description. If the video is not ready, it will take you to my blog. If you leave your name and your email address, it will let me know that you're interested, and when I get enough students who are interested, I go into full production. It takes about four to six weeks of everyday shooting and editing to get that course complete. It's a lot of, it's a big investment on my side. So I wanna know if this is something that you're interested in. Some other resources you should be aware of is our Facebook group. I will also put that link in the description. There you can share your images, you can ask me questions. If you enjoy this content and you wanna see more like it, be sure to hit that like button. It lets me know that you are interested. It also helps with the algorithm to find more students just like you. In any event, we have a ton of information to cover, so let's get started. Before we get into the buttons and controls, I wanna show you some things to set up your camera that will make your life a little easier, and I also wanna give you some words of encouragement. Do not get frustrated with yourself. Be patient, be kind to yourself, stay aligned. We're gonna go through this together, step by step, and we're going to, you're gonna learn your camera. You're gonna know it inside and out. One of the first things that I do when I get a new camera with a cap like this there is an alignment notch right here and I'll, and I'll get a silver Sharpie and I will write right over it. Just makes it easier for me see, to see the cap. And I've actually just balanced this precariously on my tripod, but I wanna show you a couple things. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna put a shoe on the bottom of the camera. And I like this particular type of shoe. It's a snap-in lock style that works with a Bogan Monfrotto tripod. I think it's probably 
maybe not the most common, probably like the second most common, but I like it for how fast it snaps in and out. And then I put it into this ball head that I can snap and lock it in. And now it's, it's locked in. It's not going anywhere. And this is an older version of, of the ball head, but a good tripod will allow you to change the heads that you put on it. Maybe you'll have a head for video work where you're panning and tilting, or maybe you have one for landscape shooting where you want to move your camera around. You can adjust the tension to make it tighter or more loose. You can go vertical. There's lots of great things about ball heads. And I put this usually on my gear page of my blog. There's a newer version and there's different variations in terms of cost. But first thing you want to do, obviously, if you're, if you're doing video work, if you're doing landscape shooting, get a good tripod, get a shoe system that is quick and easy to use. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a lens onto my camera mount. And what you'll notice is this little notch is that when you rotate it, there will be a red mark. And that is going to line up with a red mark on my lens. There's a couple things that I want to point out before I, I throw this on here. Obviously, when you change lenses, you want to be careful to avoid getting dust inside the sensor. I always change my camera lenses when with the camera body facing down. We live in a microbe world. There's dust and particles everywhere. So we want to minimize the amount of dust and particles that will get into the camera. On the crash course, I will teach you how to clean your sensor. It's pretty straightforward if you have the right tools. And something else I want to point out is that in the case of this mount in this sensor size, this is an APS-C sized sensor. And what that means, an APS-C sized sensor is smaller than a 35 millimeter full frame sensor. And because of this, there is a crop factor where we multiply the crop factor times the focal length of our lens to give us an equivalent focal length. And a lot of this will make, will make sense as you learn more about lenses. I have a 50 millimeter lens. It's also referred to as the Nifty 50 1.8. It's the RF version of it. it. Runs about $200, $250, depending on when you get it, if there's a sale. Highly recommended. It is a great portrait lens. If you're just getting started, great value. But because I am shooting a 50 millimeter, on a crop sensor body, this is going to behave as a 50 millimeter times 1.6 equals 80 millimeters. And 80 millimeters is like the sweet spot for portrait focal length. That's right where you wanna be, at least if you're looking to get flattering images. So keep that in mind. Any lenses that you put on this mount, you're going to multiply by a factor of 1.6 to get the equivalent full frame focal length. So when I'm ready to put my lens on, I'm going to line up these red marks and I'm going to rotate it until I hear a click. Now off to the side of the camera, this is the lens release. So you'll, if you do it right, it'll be locked. But when we're ready to remove the lens, we're going to push the lens release and we're going to rotate it up to the vertical position again. And then we can switch lenses. Under every good lens cap, you will find the thread size. So what is this little circle with the line 43 millimeters mean. It basically means that if you want to use filters on your lens, you would get size 43 millimeter filters. And in some cases, you'll see it on the lens as well. Before I put the memory card in, I want to show you something that's pretty important because we have a special situation here with the R50. I like SanDisk Extreme Pro cards. This is the one I use almost exclusively with the exception of some Lexars occasionally. These cards appear to be the same, but they are not. Because when I flip them over, you will see that this has a set, one set of pins, and this has two sets of pins. One set of pins refers to UHS class one memory card. This is a slightly older design, and the newer design with two pins is faster. It writes faster for high speed sport shooting, for example. This is the card you want to go with. Now, having said that, the Canon R50, its memory card slot is designed for UHS-1, meaning that if you do go out and buy a UHS-2 memory card, you are not going to get the speed advantages. It will still work, but it will not be as fast as if it was a UHS-2 slot card. Something important to keep in mind because the cost between these two cards is very different. So the advice I always give is buy the largest, fastest card that you can. If you are going to be doing any kind of video recording, 
at minimum, get a card. You can see this little symbol here. It says U and it has a three on the inside of it. Class U3 is the minimum sustained write speed for 4K video. So if you have the intentions of shooting 4K video, you are going to need a memory card that says U3. It's not like you can find one of your old memory cards sitting in you know, a drawer somewhere. Typically these are performance types of cards. And if you use a cheap card or you try to use a cheap card, it's just gonna, going to stop recording. So keep that in mind. At minimum, UHS-1 class U3 card for 4K recording. You can use a UHS-2 card, but it will not give you any speed advantages. Probably should have shown you this before I put the shoe on. I'm gonna take my memory card. Again, pins down towards the back of the camera, and I'm going to push it in until I hear it click. To remove the memory card, you're going to push it and then slide it out. I get a lot of students who ask, how do I get my images off my camera faster? And what's, what's happening is they're using Wi-Fi to try to download their images because they're used to doing it on their phones. The fastest way to move your images from your camera to your computer is by removing your memory card, putting it into an, an SD card reader, and downloading the images off your card. It's very fast, it's very easy. Then we have the battery. It's gonna go into the same slot. If you look in here, you will see four pins back there, kind of hard to see here, but those four gold pins match up with these four gold slots. So these pins are facing towards the back of the camera as we push it in, push it in until you hear it click. And then to release it, you push it down, battery pops out, and now I'll put the, now I'll put the uh, shoe back on. Get this thing all squared away. Sometimes that happens is you'll 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 get a camera where the door doesn't quite open with the the shoe on, and sometimes it does. But I I love these shoes because they're so quick that I, I don't care. I'll just take it off when I use it. Something else you should know about your camera is it has a built-in flash. It's not a very large light source, and it's very close to the lens, so it's not always very flattering. But this is useful for one particular type of shoot is when you're doing portraits in heavy backlight. I will demonstrate how to use this on the full crash course, but this is how you activate the flash. Just lift it up. Talking about some of the side controls, there's a few things I want to point out. Nearly all RF lenses have a control ring that you can customize to do different things. I'll be demonstrating how to customize buttons later. This is a control versus focus. So if you want this to be the focus ring, you would leave it on focus. If you wanted the control ring to be customized, you would flip it over to control. On the side, the left side of the R50, we have a microphone jack that if you pull this rubber gasket off, you will see a microphone port that you will need to use to get good audio quality. There are microphones built into the camera, but the way they operate within the camera body, they're not the best. You're gonna notice that the quality is, is really not that great. Just a limitation of having microphones inside the camera body. On the other side of the camera, you'll notice that we have a USB slot, USB-C, and then we have our HDMI out terminal. On the crash course, I will demonstrate what this is for, how you run it out to a monitor, something like an Atomos Ninja 5, if you would want to do that, but this gives us some other options. Right here, we have this little illumination light that will kick on when you're using a timer or if you need a focus assist. Now, as we look at the top of the camera, Obviously we have our shutter button, pretty important. I like to call this guy our primary control wheel because our finger, our number one finger will be on it. We have our ISO control over here. We'll be talking about that in just a moment. Video record button. Something you'll notice is this little white tick mark here is where the mode dial is pointing to. And we have our power switch. Now one of the things that's important that you'll notice about the R50 is it's missing a center firing pin for the flash unit. And then if you look up here, you're gonna see some pins that are not on most cameras. Canon has really struggled dealing with third-party flash manufacturers. Let's just put it that way. And I think what Canon's trying to do is to, is to protect their intellectual data. I get it. But this is very rare to see a hot shoe with no center pin. If you don't have that center pin, you're not going to be able to even use a manual flash. That's my understanding. So there is an adapter that Canon now makes. It's like $45 that if you use that adapter, you will be able to use 30 third party strobe units like the Godox TT685C. That's the one I recommend. Runs about, you know, like $110, totally worth every penny. Canon strobe units can be very expensive. You know, some of the flagship models are over $1,000. So I always get my students to start with the $100 uh, 
third-party strobes to learn how to use them. And as they get more and more serious about it, then they they can upgrade to the higher professional models. Comes with this little guy that covers it. Protect your, the little circuitry in here. But yeah, suffice it to say, third-party flashes are not going to work the same unless you have that adapter. I'll cover that on the crash course and I'll demonstrate all that. So I've twisted the camera a little bit so you can see these two thumb buttons. There's a, a thumb rest ergonomically made so your thumb can grab the camera right here. But there are two of these buttons here. So anytime you see a star like this on a Canon camera, this deals with the exposure lock or the flash exposure lock if we're using a flash. Below that, we see some tick marks in a cross formation. That is your focusing square selector. And you'll also notice that we, we have these icons in white next to them. These deal with what these buttons do during playback. So when you play an image back and you press this top button, it's going to magnify the image. And then the bottom button will allow you to jump through uh, clusters of images instead of single images. You'll notice that when I take this pencil and I put it near the viewfinder, that the back monitor turns off. And then this has to do with this little switch right here. This is a battery saving feature with the idea of being that when you put the camera to your face, it's going to save battery by only leaving the EVF on. That's the electronic viewfinder. Now there's ways, there should be some ways to customize this in the menu. Some of the other buttons and controls, obviously we have a touch screen. If you're watching this, it should be in English. I'm going to set this up real quick and we're good to go. We're going to hit okay. Now, when you come into this page, it's going to try to walk you through connecting your camera to your smartphone. And we get enough people interested in this, I'll make a separate video. Sometimes the Canon app works great, and sometimes it can be super frustrating. But out of all the camera companies, it's one of the more polished ones. That's been my experience. But we're going to skip this for now. Hopefully, we can come back to it in another lesson. Talking about some of the other buttons in here. So let's just, you can see, okay, I took a picture. I'm going to take another one. So we have the play button. If we wanted to see the pictures, there they are. So this is very intuitive. If, if you have a smartphone, you're probably used to it. If you pinch out, you're zooming in. If you pinch in, you're zooming out. You can push the cluster button we talked about, and it gives you a grid view. If we continue to push it, it would zoom out and zoom out. And you can see stacks and stacks and stacks of images. We can also push the, the top button. Now we're zooming in. Now the info button, again, will work differently depending on whether we're in a shooting mode or we're, if we're in a play mode. So if I push the info button here, and this is something I want you to do, get your camera, get it in your hand. This is very important because I get so many comments. Hey, how did you get that one screen? Because I'm pushing the info button. Get your camera, turn it on, put it on AV mode, and just sit there and push your info button. Obviously, no icons. Then we have what I just called the, the black screen. Then we have, this is also a very popular way to shoot where you get a lot of the most important information without crowding the screen. We'll talk about each of these in a moment. Then we get a lot more information. Then we have our digital level and our histogram. The way the level works is if I take this tripod and I tilt it down, you can see these tick marks in the middle are now red. And something else that's hap- happening is the camera is fading on and off as a battery saving feature. So I'm gonna come in and turn those off. Power saving. It's like after a few seconds, the screen's going dim. So I'm gonna turn that to disable. I'm gonna turn off all these to disable as I'm teaching because it'll just be easier. Coming back to this level, you can see that the two tick marks on the interior that when I go up and down, it shows me their relative position and their alignment. When they're green, that means I am on the dead horizon. So this is level right now, but if I was to take the tripod and push it to one side, you can see that the red exterior axes are, they're turning unparalleled. When it's all lined up, it should all be green. I'm a little off. Something like that. A histogram is a statistical tool that is telling us how even the brightness is. It's a lot to go into. There's a free lesson on it on the crash course. Suffice it to say, anything on this side of the histogram, this is pure black. And anything on this side is pure white. So when you get a histogram bump that's in between pure black and pure white, that means there's information in there and there's enough de- there should be enough detail to see what your subject is. If you take a pure black image, you'll 
you're just going to get a peak over here. If it's overexposed or if it's too bright, it'll be over here. I know it's a lot to go into. Just keep in mind that this is a tool to help you measure exposure. And as I push the info button again, we, we recycle through all of those screens. Now, something else about the info button is that when we are playing an image back and press the info button, we can see different types of information about our image. We get our serial number, 0002. We get some metadata that I'll explain in a moment. But if we continue to push info, wow, now we get a histogram. Push info again, we get our color histogram. It's telling me the lens, the focal length, the aperture that I was using. Push it again. You can see our white balance that was used, the sh picture styles I was using. So there's tons of information when you play your images back. Now, there are a couple other buttons here that I haven't talked about that we're going to go into a lot more detail. But as we're getting set up, this is the deep menu button. It's a lot to go into. I usually spend an hour or two hours on the crash course, like really going through everything. There are really most of the settings. There's only a few that you'll change, and I'll probably point out a lot of them in this video. And the last set of buttons we haven't talked about is right here. This is the directional pad. It, like the info button, will behave differently depending on what we're doing. I'm gonna tap the shutter button. So let me explain each of these symbols real quick. This symbol here with the plus minus sign, anytime you see this, this is dealing with the brightness of an image. This is an exposure control. And in this case, exposure compensation. AF stands for autofocus. MF stands for manual focus. So if I wanted to use autofocus or manual focus, I could jump in and out of those by pushing to the left, tapping my shutter button to jump out of it. If I am playing an image and I push down on the garbage can, this will allow me to erase it. And if I am shooting and I push to the right, I am going to access my drive modes, which is what the camera does after we push the shutter button down all the way. And you can see that there's a bunch of drive modes and we'll talk about these in a moment. If you are in a shooting mode and you press the Q button, it is going to pull up your secondary shooting settings. We'll talk about these in just a moment, just trying to show you what they are. And if you're in the black screen, you see this Q button, it's Q button here. This will also allow us to access these settings, which are, will be highlighted with an orange square. We can also use the touch monitor. We can also use the directional pad to select. We can jump out. We can also jump into that by pressing the Q button. Something that Canon does a really nice job of in terms of the functionality and the usability is they give you multiple options to access the same controls. And it, they really leave it up to you in terms of preference, in terms of how you want to access those controls. So now we want to start talking about our primary camera settings. So when I rotate the control wheel, we get this menu thing that pops up. And I find this kind of annoying. Canon is trying to help us to allow us to you know, learn the camera better, but we're going to go ahead and turn these off by coming into the menu and then we're going to go to guide mode and we're going to this mode guide and we're going to disable it. Same with the feature guide. I'm going to disable this because I'm about to show you all this good stuff. So now when I turn the mode dial, you can see that we don't get that interruption. Put it on M so you can see the M in the corner so I can talk to you about your primary camera settings. Let's talk about what some of these icons mean. And in the beginning, it is very important to take a look at three numbers. You're going to see them on every camera. You're going to, going to see them in the bottom of your EVF. These are your primary exposure settings. It is your shutter speed, your aperture, and your ISO. Shutter speed is the amount of time that the shutter is open and the sensor is being exposed to light. In this case, it would be one four hundredth of a second, pretty quick. We're also getting an exposure preview and it's darker. So I, I know if I was to take a picture here, this would be a dark image. Anytime you see a number with an F in front of it, this is referring to the F-stop. And I'm gonna make it brighter here for a second to explain what your F-stop is. Your F-stop is a ratio dealing with the dimensions of the lens. So anytime you see a number that has an F in front of it, this is dealing with our aperture. Now there's something very important I want to point out about F-stop numbers. It's counterintuitive. When you have smaller F numbers, the opening is wider. And when you have larger 
f numbers, the opening gets smaller. So it's it's the opposite. It's counterintuitive. So a, a number like f 1.8 that is a very wide aperture. It's very wide open. A number like f 22 is going to be teeny teeny tiny, and the size of the lens aperture is going to also help determine how much light is coming through the lens and hitting the sensor. These two factors right here, shutter speed and aperture, pretty much control the light. There's nothing else that controls the light, just the amount of time and how large that opening is. I'm gonna turn this down for a second here. And I'll talk about these controls in a minute. I wanted to talk about ISO. Think of ISO as an artificial boost that the sensor gets after it has captured light. It is not clean light. It's more of a gain in, in signal. It, the camera is adding more boost to it, so to speak. And there are some advantages and disadvantages of using higher and lower ISOs. I'll demonstrate those real quick. So let me dial these camera settings in. Now, something you should keep in mind, every good photographer is constantly aware of what their shutter speed, their aperture, and their ISO are. While we're on the topic of ISO, what I want to point out, I'm going to, yeah, I'll shoot it in here, is some people will say, well, why don't we just turn the ISO up all the way and we'll just get this great boost? Well, there's a trade-off. So I'm, I'm doing this all in manual right now, and I will teach you, tell you what, let's go into aperture priority mode to make this a little bit easier. So let's say we take a picture with an ISO of 400. We play it back and we zoom in on one of the blinds edges. You can see it's nice and clean, right? And then let's take another picture where we just boost it all the way up as high as it'll go. ISO 32,000, take a picture. We're gonna play that picture back and now we're gonna zoom in and look at that same edge. So the trade-off of higher ISOs is that we get a lot of noise grain. And the amount of light that you're shooting in really plays quite a bit of this. If you have really good light, you can get away with higher ISOs, but you wouldn't really need to because you could use a longer shutter speed. But for the sake of this conversation, just keep in mind that as you bump your ISO up higher and higher and higher, you're going to get more boost to the light coming into the camera, but it's also going to be more grainy. If I am shooting professionally, I like to stay between 400 to 800 because I know it's going to look pretty good between those. But yeah, I mean, in, there are times you got to shoot 1600, you got to shoot 3200. It just really depends on your shooting situation. So flipping it back to manual, shutter speed is the length of time the shutter is open and exposing the sensor. Aperture is how wide that opening is. And your ISO is how much boost the camera is giving it. Critical pieces of information as you are getting started. Let's talk about some of these other icons as we start moving into the secondary settings. Just on this screen, it's a little different. In the top left-hand corner, we have the shooting mode that we're in. If I rotate it to any of the other shooting modes, you can see it changing. The numbers between these brackets deal with the number of images that we can fit onto our memory card using the current settings that we're set up for. This number here, 20, deals with the number of shots we have in our buffer. So if we were to sh start shooting rapidly, this is gonna start counting down and eventually it'll come to a point where the buffer will halt. It'll actually slow down. This number here, one hour, deals with the length of time we can record video before the camera would stop recording. Obviously, this is considering that we're using a fast enough memory card. In the past, there were many Canon cameras that had a half hour limit, well, 20, just under half an hour, 29 minutes, 59 seconds. So we have a full hour we can record. This is our battery indicator. It tells us how full our battery is. Anytime you see Q, it really means you're dealing with a quick menu. You can see we have a quick menu button here. We have a quick menu button here. We have our focal length of our lens. This guy here, is enable touch shutter. I usually have it disabled because it drives me crazy when I bump the camera and it starts taking pictures. Now, having said that, there are certain types of photography that this works really well with. If you're stacking images, which is a technique of taking multiple 
images and combining them all together to get a really nice depth of field with great sharpness. Macro photography, touch shutter is actually a really great tool. But if you're not doing that kind of you know shooting, then I would say disable this. And below that, we also have this magnifying glass, which looks exactly as this magnifying glass. So in this instance, this magnifying glass allows us to achieve a digital zoom, to zoom in on the blinds if we wanted to, we can zoom in. And there's a technique I'll be showing a little bit later when using manual focus in conjunction with that magnifying glass. Because we're in a shooting mode, this magnifying glass doesn't really apply. This is our exposure lock. So let's take a look at some of these other icons as we press the info button. We can see tons of these icons. There's, there's a better screen to see what all of these guys meet. We talked about this already. We're going to come into the black screen menu, which can also act as a cue menu. And you'll notice here, here are our primary exposure settings. We have our shutter speed, 1 125th, F4, ISO 400. In this screen, if you press the Q button here or the Q button here, we get this orange highlight. And remember, I've turned off the prompts in the menu so they don't pop up. It's right here. It is uh, feature guide is disabled. So if you don't have if you have this enabled, you're going to see these prompts explaining what all this stuff means. I think it's easier for me to teach this way. But if I jump into the Q menu, you can see that I can touch on these icons to navigate. I can use the directional pad. And the touchscreen is very intuitive. It's very easy to come in and change your aperture using the touchscreen instead of using the primary control wheel. And this works for all of the settings. And even if it's highlighted, you can rotate your primary control wheel if you don't want to jump into that menu. And you can jump around and change directly from the sub menu. Or if you want to jump in and see everything, you can come do it this way. Let's talk about what each of these mean. This is our exposure compensation, and I'm going to give you a full lesson on that a little bit later in this video. Exposure compensation allows you to change the brightness of your image in the P, TV, or AV modes. Again, anytime you see this plus minus sign, that is dealing with image brightness. So you could probably guess, here we have a plus minus sign, but we also have a little lightning bolt. This is flash exposure compensation. It allows us to control how bright or how dark our flash is firing. So it keeps kicking me out. These guys here are our picture styles. Each one of these icons deals with a, a different setting that you can come in and tweak. I like to think of picture styles as sets of recipes that will bake our images in slightly different ways. So if I come in here, if you are a pair beginner, I would say hold off on this for now, leave it on A or S. But the idea of this is that it will allow us to tell the camera, hey, we're shooting portraits, we want to get more accurate flesh tones. Or hey, we're shooting landscapes, we want the blues of the skies to be more vibrant, maybe some brighter greens. Or maybe we're shooting macro, we want some fine detail. And the camera will give these different recipes. It'll try to match what you're suggesting it do. Now, in the beginning, I, again, I wouldn't worry about this, but videographers are, are very keen on changing these and tweaking them and turning their sharpness and their contrast down because they're, they're going to add them in post. But if I was going to make a re recommendation, just leave it on A or S for now. And later, as you get more advanced, you may want to come in and tweak these settings. And the settings, according to these icons, are sharpness strength, sharpness fineness, threshold, then we have our contrast, saturation, and color tone. And what will happen is if you push to the right and left, you can turn any of those settings up and down. I would not recommend it if you're just getting started. Do not worry about that for now. This guy here is our white balance. We'll be talking about this in a moment. White balance tells the camera what kind of light we're shooting in, and it will make adjustments to make it more neutral. You can see all these different icons and how it's tweaking the color. We'll come back to this in a moment. And then we have our white balance shift and bracket. I don't recommend messing with this for now. It allows us to shift the color balance in different directions. In all my years of shooting, I think I have used this once. So in the last 15 years of shooting. So most people will not use that. 
Then we come to Auto Light Optimizer. Our Auto Light Optimizer is basically giving the camera instructions to add a little bit of contrast to make your JPEGs look, you know, kind of more baked in camera. Does not a, a lot of these settings don't apply apply to RAW, uh, but if you're doing JPEGs, you know, then your white balance, your picture styles, your Auto Light Optimizer all matter. The metering mode we will discuss a little bit later in this video. This is how the camera measures light entering the lens, different shapes and patterns of the viewfinder. Coming down to this AF in the box with the circle that's moving, these are our focusing clusters. I prefer to call them clusters. Different boxes and shapes and sizes where we tell the camera to look when we're focusing. Next to it, we have our focusing modes. We'll be talking about this in a moment. Then we have our drive modes. This is what the camera does after we push a shutter button down all the way. Does it take a single image, multiple images, or does it use a timer? And then we have our image quality settings. This deals with whether we're shooting JPEG or HIF files, high efficiency image format, which I don't really like. I still like JPEGs. Or if we're shooting in raw files. So the way this works, and there's also a deep menu, you're gonna see something in the deep menu here. On the red tab, first page, it's the same way to change everything, but this allows us to do it from the black screen, is this is where we tell the camera how to record our images. Do we want it to be recorded as a RAW file, or do we want it to be recorded as a JPEG? Long story short, if you are doing professional work or you know it's, it's really important that you know you're gonna be pushing it in post and you're gonna be editing it hard, shoot in raw. Now there are a couple other things I wanna point out in here is that this deals with the dimensions of our sensors. 6,000 pixels wide by 4,000 pixels tall. And if you multiply those numbers together, you get your 24 megapixels, which is the resolution of our sensor. And again, we have the number of shots remaining on our memory card. Watch what happens when I change to raw. Did you see how quick that number dropped down to 1,631? And the reason is, is that raw files are larger. They take up a ton of space. In fact, when a raw file is converted into a JPEG, you can lose anywhere from 70 to 85% of your image. And the trade-off is, is that JPEG images are smaller, but there's not as much information. You can't really push them in editing as hard. So the, this is why I give the advice is if you're doing a paid shoot and you're not taking lots of images, it makes sense to shoot in raw. You know, if you're shooting thousands upon thousands of images at a sporting event or, you know, or even a wedding reception, then it makes sense to shoot in JPEG and, and have not, so, not as many. And that's kind of the rule of thumb that I use. There are situations where you'll take thousands of images and they should all be in RAW too. It just really depends on what you're doing. When both of these are selected, that means you are recording both a RAW image and a JPEG image. There's a copy of each on your memory card. Now, something else you'll probably notice is that we can shoot in JPEG only by selecting this RAW to this dash, or we can shoot in RAW only. So no JPEG would be selected, right? And when you come back out, it's telling you what format we're shooting in. There is something else I want you to notice here is that we have a smooth L. It's like a smooth shape L and a jagged stair step L. This deals with image compression. And image compression is when the processor or the camera's computer starts throwing away color information to save space. And if you look at the number of shots remaining between smooth L and jagged L, Typically, it turns out that we can take twice as many images on Jagged L. And when I first got started, I did tons of research and tests on this. And I learned that most of the wedding photographers at the time were shooting in Jagged L. The files were smaller. They were easier to upload and to process, to open and close, especially when you're shooting thousands of them, right? So I even printed these at Smooth L and Jagged L and I could not see the difference. And I said, you know what? If I can't really see the difference between Smooth L and Jagged L, why not just shoot in Jagged L and you know, get those benefits? Now, having said that, there's also a difference between raw and C-RAW. Compressed raw is somewhat similar, where we have all of the information with raw and we have a compressed version of raw with C-RAW. Some of that information is thrown out. And this is very difficult to see the difference, however, I can see this when shooting astrophotography. 
I can see it in edges of highlights next to like dark shadows. You'll see compression artifacts. And with time, depending on what you specialize in, you will know exactly which of the RAWs to shoot with and which of the JPEGs to shoot with. But this is where we, we can control it. We also have the ability to shoot in smaller image sizes. So when we come to medium, we go from 24 megapixels to 11 megapixels. And again, we have smooth and jagged M. And then we have a small size, which is 5.9 megapixels. Smooth and jagged. And then we have a small two, which is a 3.8. Now there's gonna be a temptation among many of you. Well, I just want, I'm gonna shoot small file sizes. And for certain applications, like maybe if you're posting images to, I don't know, Facebook or eBay, and you don't need a lot of resolution, I guess it could make sense. The problem is it's not so easy to go from a small resolution file to a large resolution file. It's very easy to go from a large resolution file to a small re resolution file. You know, I just tell all my beginning students shoot in either smooth L or jagged L to start. And once you get more comfortable and you know what you're doing, then start making those changes. It is going to be to your advantage to learn how to process raw files at some point, but for now, I wouldn't worry about it too much. We just set you up on Jagged L or Smooth L for now. And again, that is all accessible in the black screen right here. It just kicks us out relatively quick. Something else you'll notice is that when we get this half crescent moon, it's talking about the primary control wheel. And when we see these arrows to the left and right, that is dealing with the directional pad. And some of these other ones we've, we've already seen, we got our battery, we have our, our Wi-Fi indicator, our Bluetooth indicator, and number of shots remaining. And that's the black screen. Now that we've talked about the icons on this screen, what I wanna do is press the info button again. And in this time, I'm going to press the info button one more time, and then we get the quick menu overlay as we're shooting in many of these, you are going to recognize because we've already discussed them. So here we have our focusing clusters, our focusing modes. We have our image quality, which we've already discussed. We have our metering modes. We have our white balance, our picture styles, and we have a couple other things in there in here that we haven't seen. To access these as we're shooting, press the Q button. And the way this layout works is that we have two columns on each side. And as we come down the columns and select what we want, we have the options here on the bottom. Now this running guy is subject detection, a human running. If I move to the right, I can see I'm on auto, people, animals, cars, or I can turn it off completely. What Canon has done here is through advanced learning in the software, is it's giving us human tracking or eye tracking in animals. It helps our camera find the eyes of our subjects. And in this case, in the case of cars, maybe the windshield of somebody as they're driving. Certain subjects require certain focus positions. In humans and animals, it's the eyeball. We want the eyeball to be in focus. Or we can just leave it on an auto. Coming down, we have image quality, metering modes, Anti-flicker shooting tells the camera to essentially analyze certain types of lamps that are flickering. You'll see it in sodium-based lamps on the on streets at night, is that if you take pictures with this turned off and you look at the color of the light, it'll alternate between like an orange to more of a bluish. And then when you shoot with flicker control on, the color will be consistent. And the camera is basically pacing out when those flickers happen and shooting between them. So I leave it turned off because it rarely comes into a situation where I personally use it a lot. Continuing to come down, we have our white balance. We're talking about this in a minute. Picture styles we've discussed. Creative filters, I'm not a huge fan of. If you wanna check them out, play with them. They're, they're not a professional tool, but the idea is that you can apply different effects before you take the image, you got art bold, water painting effects. You can't really see it here because we're, we're dealing with the blinds, but it's it's here if you want to play with it. And we also have it up here on our mode dial, but I'm just not a huge fan of it. Aspect ratio, we're going to leave it at three by two for now. That is using the full dimensions of the sensor. If you wanted to shoot in a four third aspect ratio, you could. You can see it's cropping the sides off. My dad loves shooting at 16 by nine. It's just how he likes to take pictures. So. This would shoot in a cinema aspect ratio. 
or if you're shooting for Instagram, one to one. So you got 4,000 by 4,000 pixels, and that's a 16 megapixel image. So this is the quick screen in the shooting overlay. Come back out. Real quick, I want to I want you to turn your mode dial to the video camera icon because there is some information in here that changes a little bit. So when we come into this screen, you'll notice that the bottom and the top are kind of cropped off a little bit into that 16 by 9 aspect ratio. This little icon here is telling us where the camera orients the frame because this camera has vertical shooting mode. But in this mode, it will be recorded as a horizontal image. If we were shooting in a, in a vertical mode, then you would see this icon changing. Let's go into info. Here's another important icon. And you, you'll notice that as I'm talking, these levels are jumping up and back and forth. Some of them are turning yellow. And if I snap my finger, you would see some red. These are, these are our audio levels. And it's telling us how loud the audio is. Anything in white, in this white to yellow area is fine. Red is bad. Red means that you're going to be clipping out your sound. So real quick, the way we can change this is jumping into our deep menu while we're in the video mode, come down to sound recording, and definitely we want to turn this to manual. If you leave it in auto, what will happen is the camera will change the amount of signal boost. And so the audio fluctuations will be jumping around everywhere. And we can also change the amount coming in here. We can turn it down, we can turn it up. And we're basically looking for the point that we're staying in this white to yellow range. We don't want the red, then we hit OK. The wind filters never worked for me, so I usually disable it. But now, when we come back out and we're talking, we can see that we're in the safe range a little bit better. Now, if you remember, when we were in our still shooting mode, in a quick control, we would get these columns on either side, and they're a little bit different for video shooting. For example, the shooting mode for video, I, you know, it's an automatic mode here. I'm almost always on manual exposure for video. We also have movie for close-ups, image stabilization mode, HDR mode, and we have some auto exposure modes, but I'm almost always on manual exposure when I'm shooting video. Coming down, we have our focusing clusters for video. We have our subject detection. We can jump in to our audio recording, so we don't need to go into the deep menu. We can do it from here if we wanted to. We have our movie record size. This is the resolution and the frame rate of our video. So the settings in here, this first one deals with the resolution, 1920 by 1080, that's standard HD. And the number after it is the frames per second. And then below that, we have the compression type, IPB, which essentially looks at the previous frame in the next frame. It does a quick calculation and it throws away any information that has not changed to save file space. Light IPB is more compressed than standard IPB. You can see that at light IPB, 60 frames per second, we have three hours and 51 minutes compared to standard IPB at 30 frames per second, four and a half hours. So you can see how the frames per second and the type of compression change how long we can re record for. If we go to light IPB again at 30 frames per second, we can shoot for 11 hours and 14 minutes. And then if we go to standard IPB at 24 frames per second, it's a little bit different. So I know many of you are thinking about where's the 4K? Here is the 4K. 3840 by 2160 is 4K, and we have 30 frames per second, standard, light, and then we can also shoot at 24 frames per second standard, 24 frames per second light. 24 frames per second is typically what movies are recorded cinema. Anyway, suffice it to say, this is where you select your video quality. It's warning us that it might get hot. I haven't done the test, so I don't know if it'll shut down shooting in 4K. Now, something that's awesome about the R50 is that it oversamples video at 6K and then it downsizes it to 4K. In the past, what cameras would do is they do something called line skipping or pixel binning. It's basically where they take a, they take like every other line or every three lines and they throw one away. So you're losing information as the video is being recorded and it results in a very unsharp look. 
So when you're getting oversampling, it looks way better. So, and that's what the R50 does. So in terms of the value that we're getting for the cost, it's pretty spectacular in terms of images and what it can do with video. So what else do we have in here? Digital movie image stabilization is something I typically leave turned off. That as we turn this on or go into enhanced, you'll notice the camera is zooming in a little bit. And what happens is it's, it's a software application that basically stabilizes our image. I guess there are times where it makes sense, but you can also do it in post, but you lose resolution because the camera's cropping in on your video. So I usually leave that turned off. Then we have our white balance, which is a lot more important for video. Our picture styles, same thing, very important for video because we're not recording in a raw type of file. This is a JPEG type of file. Creative filters in digital zoom are turned off. Here we have this temperature indicator right here. We can start and stop video recording from here. And that, ladies and gentlemen, are all of the icons and overlays that we see in both stills and video. Now we are going to get into the exposure control lesson. Of all the lessons on this video, this is the most important one. It deals with the mode dial and how to change our image brightness using the mode dial. Now you'll notice on our camera, we have this A with a plus next to it. This is a mode that I have always referred to as the dummy mode. The dummy mode allows you to basically use your camera as a point and shoot, similar to a way that you would use your smartphone camera. Now, even in this case, there would still be some huge advantages of this camera over a smartphone simply because of the sensor size. The sensor in the R50 is 20 to 25 times the size of your smartphone sensor. And because it's capturing a lot more light in terms of the image quality as it's being captured, it's far superior. There's a lot of software going on in smartphones helping them out. And in some cases, it's ridiculous. There was a, a story I read recently online how smartphone manufacturer was using AI to create fake images of the moon to make you think you were taking pictures of the moon, but it wasn't. Suffice to say that most of the stuff that we're still taking with, with regular cameras in terms of interchangeable lens cameras, it's, those are still considered you know actual images. We're, we live in a crazy time. Maybe it will continue to change. But the reason I'm saying this is you did not purchase this camera to shoot in dummy mode. I understand when you're just getting started and you, you don't want to you know, spend any time learning anything. But if you spent this money on this camera, take the time to really learn what it's capable of. And this lesson I'm about to give you right now is going to lay the foundation for it. In regards to still shooting, there's really only four modes. And they are P, TV, AV, and M. Those are the only ones you really need to worry about. And most of the time I'm shooting in M or AV. So there's really only two modes for, for Michael the Maven with one exception that I'll, I'll talk about later. The easiest way for me to teach you this is to start in AV mode. AV stands for aperture value. And you'll notice that when we're in, when we're in this mode, we have lost the ability to select our shutter speed. It's telling us here that if we take our primary control finger on our primary control wheel, we can change the f-stop. So I'm changing the f-stop, I'm making it smaller, now I'm making it larger. And if you're looking at the screen, you'll notice something very weird going on. That as I'm changing the aperture size, the brightness is not changing. That is physically impossible. How can we change the aperture without the brightness changing? It's impossible. So an F5, you know, it's a rather large opening. F22, it's going to be tiny, probably even smaller than that. And it more or less stays the same. What in the world is going on here? So I'm going to show you a secret in terms of how to see this. I want you to tap the shutter button. When we tap the shutter button, lo and behold, the shutter speed is revealed. And as we rotate our primary control wheel to change the primary setting, which is aperture, you'll notice that the shutter speed is changing. So the heart of the matter with aperture priority mode is that we change the aperture and the camera changes the shutter speed for us. Aperture priority mode, we change the aperture. The camera helps us out by changing the shutter speed. So no matter how we change, the aperture, if we have enough light, 
we're gonna maintain the brightness. Now there's another side to this that I want you to demonstrate is that tapping the shutter button, I want you to take your hand and slowly move it in front of the camera, blocking the light. And what you'll notice is that the shutter speed is changing. Gotta tap that shutter button to see it. Did you see these tick marks here? Those are seconds. It's saying to shoot this and get an even exposure, we need a four second exposure. We really need to let that light come in. But the reason why I'm showing you this is to demonstrate that this operates based on the amount of light entering the camera, not the camera settings. Because we're shutting the aperture down and we're making the aperture smaller, the camera recognizes that less light's coming in. If you were to go into a dark area, the camera would say, you need a 10 second exposure. I get a lot of emails from people who say, hey, you know, I, why are all my pictures blurry? And the first thing I ask, I say, what's your shutter speed? And they're like, oh, one tenth of a second. I'm like, that's probably the reason. And I say, go outside on a sunny day and take some pictures. And the reason is, is because there's lots of light outside and the camera will automatically give them a faster shutter speed. If you're trying to take pictures indoors and you don't have a lot of light, the camera is going to try to use longer exposures. So a couple quick side notes about aperture priority is that when I would shoot weddings, I would shoot an aperture priority. Why? Because you'd be inside of a chapel and now you're in a lobby and now you're outside. And because we're changing these lighting conditions so fast and I'm walking backwards and I'm thinking about focusing and composition, I don't have time to worry about my shutter speed. I'd just rather have the camera do it. And another thing is, is a lot of people are surprised to learn that when I shoot sports, I shoot an aperture priority. Why? Because it's usually outdoors and it's sunny and the camera is going to use a much faster shutter speed. I can lock in my aperture and just basically I sneak a peek as I'm shooting. So this brings us to the two shutter speed barriers you should be aware of. The first is 1 60th of a second. If you are shooting a portrait of a person who is cooperating, this as a beginner should be your slowest shutter speed, 1 60th of a second. If you're trying to shoot at 1 30th or 1 20th or 1 10th of a second, there's a pretty good chance it's gonna be blurry. In fact, I would even recommend, you know, if, if you're just getting started, 1 100th of a second, it's a little bit faster. For sports shooting, for, for human athletes, adults running, minimum 1 500th of a second, probably even faster, 1 1,000th, 1 2,000th of a second is more desirable. So always keep that in mind, those barriers in the back of your mind when you are shooting in aperture priority mode. So the question you probably have, Michael, how do we change the brightness? If this is too dark, how do we make it brighter? Okay, there is a short answer to this, and there's a long answer to this, and I'm gonna give you the short answer first. So let's open this up to F4. The short answer is this thing right here, the exposure compensation bar. We can touch on it, and we can drag our finger over, and you can notice that it's getting brighter as I'm doing this. Let's make the image brighter or darker, and you should be following along with your camera in hand in all of these exercises. So the short answer is if we wanted to make it a little bit brighter, we would drag this over to one and we take a picture. And if that wasn't bright enough, we'd come back in, drag it over to two, we take another picture. And if that wasn't bright enough, that's right, we would do it again, drag it over to three and we take a picture. So when you play these three images back, if I zoom out, you can see that they have different brightnesses. So that's the short answer is we can change the brightness of our image by adjusting this thing right in here, the exposure compensation bar. So if it was too bright and we wanted it to be darker, you'll notice we have a negative over here and a plus over here. So this direction is darker. This direction is brighter. Let's just turn it down to negative two. There it is. Take a picture and it's dark. So that is the short answer of how we can change our exposure which is a fancy word for brightness in AV mode. I'm gonna tap the shutter button, jump back in. Now, it may be kind of a pain to open up this menu and touch you know, on this little bar. So there's a faster way to do this. And you'll notice that we can do it by pushing up on the directional pad. And you can see that this crescent wheel is jumping to the exposure compensation bar, and we can do it directly from there. I can push up, and now I'm back to F4, F5, right? So I can go from my aperture to my exposure compensation to my aperture again. And with time, this will become second nature. You won't even think about it. 
You're going to be shooting and you're going to say, well, maybe I want to bump up my exposure compensation a little bit. I mean, I want to turn down. I want to change my aperture. It will become second nature as you do it over and over again. Now, there is a longer answer that I'm going to take some time to explain to you because I want you to know how the mechanics of this work. It's going to lay your foundation and you're going to know more about exposure compensation than the vast majority of photographers who are getting started. Coming in to this bar here, this exposure compensation bar, we can also push on these guys, is you'll notice right here at zero. That diamond home plate is essentially telling us where the camera thinks it is an even exposure. So these numbers deal with what we refer to as stops. One stop is twice the amount of light as zero. So when we go from zero to one, we're letting in twice the amount of light. When we go from one to two, we're letting in twice the amount of light again. When we go from two to three, we're letting in twice the amount of light again, and it works in both directions. Each tick mark is worth one third of a stop. So when I rotate the primary control wheel one click, this is worth one third. So if I rotate this three times, it is at one full stop, right? So I am now going to mathematically prove to you how this works. I think this is actually pretty incredible. When, when I first figured this out, I was like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. So we're at f4.5, we're at an even exposure, and I'm gonna tap my shutter button and look at the shutter speed, 1 60th of a second, right? So if I come in and I bump up my exposure compensation, to be one stop more, which is twice the amount of light. Do you want to take any guesses on what that fraction or that shutter speed now says? Tap the shutter button, one thirtieth of a second. Why? Because one sixtieth plus one sixtieth is two sixtieths. Two sixtieths simplified is one thirtieth of a second. So we're letting in twice the amount of light as we did on the previous shot. Let's do it again. So if we were going to go to two, what do you think that shutter speed would be? Here it is, one thirtieth. So one thirtieth plus one thirtieth is two thirtieths. Two thirtieths simplified is, if you said one fifteenth, you are absolutely correct. And if we were to do it one more time, it's not going to be exact, one eighth of a second. This also works in the opposite direction. If we wanted a shutter speed that was twice as fast, as 1 60th, what do you think it'll be? If you said 1 20th, 1 1 120th or 1 1 25th, it's not perfectly even, that is half the shutter speed as this one. And if we were to do it again, now we're at 1 250th of a second. And if we were to do it again, now we're at 1 500th of a second. So the way exposure compensation works is it allows us to tell the camera, to give the camera instructions that, hey, I want you to cheat the shutter speed for me by one third of a stop, or maybe two thirds of a stop when I'm shooting, or maybe in, in the negative direction. It really depends on what you're doing. We're spoiled because we don't, we don't use film. We can take a picture or even look in the viewfinder and know what our brightness is before we even take a picture. And we can tell the camera, hey, cheat this up a little bit. Let's make it a little bit brighter. I was so happy when I first learned this. I was almost jumping for joy because a lot of that frustration was resolved. So I know that's a lot of information on aperture priority mode. We change the aperture and the camera makes the adjustments to the shutter speed. If we want to change the brightness, we can come into our exposure compensation bar and give instructions to the camera in terms of how much to cheat it. You should definitely do the exercise of taking an image at an even exposure and then changing your exposure compensation to one, changing your exposure compensation to two, and changing your exposure compensation to three. Let's talk about TV, which is time value. Time value means the shutter speed is the priority. Time, shutter speed, right? And you'll notice that instead of selecting the aperture, we're now selecting the shutter speed. Our primary selector is changing the primary factor. We are now changing the shutter speed. And the camera is making adjustments to the, can you guess what it is? If we tap the shutter button, here's our f-stops. And as we rotate 
and change the shutter speed, we can see the camera is changing the aperture. So it's the opposite of aperture priority. There are many people who like shutter priority mode. I am not one of them. I almost never use it, but it's really good for learning how the camera operates. And I'll give you an example. I just told you that the sports safety shutter speed should be about one five hundredth of a second, right? So let's say we're shooting sports and you decide to use shutter priority because you can just dial that in. I'm going to dial this in at one five hundredth of a second. Well, there's a problem here. The camera is dark. It's, it's completely pitch black. So if we were to take a picture and play that, that's no bueno, right? What's going on? And if we tap the shutter button, you're going to see the aperture flashing. Anytime you see the camera flashing a setting like this, it is complaining. And it's telling you, I cannot achieve greater than F4. I keep, this lens, the 24 to 105 lens that I have on here right now, is limited to an aperture of F4. And the camera is saying, I can't do any more than this. It's going to be dark because I have to shoot at the shutter speed and I can't open the aperture more. So the question I have for you is that if you were in this situation, you're shooting sports, it's dark, the camera's complaining, what would you do to try to solve this? I want you to think about it for a second and say your answer out loud. If you said bump your ISO up, you are absolutely correct. Watch what happens. We start adding ISO, adding more ISO. We're at 3200, I tap the shutter button, no longer complaining. We added enough boost to get an even exposure. That is very critical game you'll be playing a lot. When to add more ISO, when you can't add, add any more light, when to turn it down. I was also very happy when I discovered this through trial and error, and you don't have to do that now because now you know. So in summary, Shutter priority mode operates by allowing us to dial in the specific shutter speed, and in return, the camera will operate the aperture for us so we don't have to worry about it. If we get into a situation where it's too dark and we want to maintain, for example, one five hundredth of a second or more, we, can, we have the option of bumping up our ISO, and we can also do that in aperture priority mode. Look how fast the shutter speed is now that we've bumped this up, one five hundredth of a second. Something to keep in mind. So we've talked about aperture priority mode. We've talked about shutter priority mode. Let's talk about the P mode, program mode. Program mode is very similar to the dummy mode, but it allows us to change certain settings like our exposure compensation. We can change our white balance, our focusing modes. We start to take the training wheels off a little bit. So you can see that we have all of almost all of the Q options where we can come in and we could change the Q options if we wanted to. I know a very famous wedding photographer who shoots almost exclusively on program mode. You'll notice that we don't have shutter speed or aperture. It's not available. What's happening? We tap the shutter button, we can see it. And now we can change the combination together, both of them together of the shutter speed in the aperture. So we can get these different combinations. If I knew I wanted to shoot at F4, I could come down and, and this is the way you would do it. Now there's an important piece of information you should know about the program mode is that if you are shooting with flash at an event, shoot it in program mode. It's going to be a lot easier than trying to manage this in manual or aperture priority mode. It's not very well known, but the P mode is the handheld flash mode for Canon cameras. It's the easiest way to get started with flash. Exposure compensation works the same in the P mode as well as the shutter priority mode. You can come in, you can change if you want it brighter or darker, it's exactly the same. In P mode, it will make the adjustment through a combination of both shutter speed and aperture priority. And that is the program mode. A lot of people love it. I don't use it that much. Now let's take a look at the ever intimidating manual mode. There's some interesting things that have happened here on the bottom is you will notice that we have both the shutter speed and the aperture available for change. When you see the box, you can just click on it and change it this way. But what happened to our exposure compensation bar? Exposure compensation bar is now turned off. And the truth of the matter is, is that the exposure compensation bar does not exist in manual mode. This becomes a light meter. And if we were to tap the shutter button, See that little tick mark under there? The camera is saying it is one stop overexposed. Well, if I were to adjust my shutter speed, now it's telling me it is an even exposure. But if I try to get in there, 
I can't, it's not letting me in. So it's a, this is a light meter and you can even use it as a light meter in certain situations. But suffice it to say, in manual mode, we change the shutter speed. And by pushing the exposure control button here, we can jump over to the aperture and we control both of those settings with no help. And this is gonna become second nature to you at some point in time. A lot of my students ask, Michael, when do you shoot manual mode? Manual mode, I typically shoot when I have enough time. If I am not restricted to time, if I'm not in a rush, if I'm not in a hurry, if I am shooting strobes, if I am being patient, I am shooting in manual. If I need more control, I am shooting in manual. If I'm shooting sports or if I'm doing events, it's typically aperture priority mode. That's just me. Now, having said all these things about, manu about the different modes, there's something else I need to point out about ISO control. Our ISO controls have an auto mode. And in the beginning, I tell my students to not use it because it's going, it's going to handicap you in some ways because the camera is going to be helping you with ISO. As long as you're in this auto mode, it is going to be changing your ISO for you. And you do not want that. You want to learn how to control these guys directly, right? That said, there is a time I do recommend shooting on auto ISO in manual mode. And that would be an indoor sporting event, something like mixed martial arts, where it, it's rapidly changing lighting conditions. Now it's dark, now it's bright, now there's strobe lights, now there's flashing lights all over the place. In that kind of a situation, I would come in, I would dial in my minimum shutter speed, I would come in and change my aperture to be as wide as possible, and I would let the camera make these quick rapid changes to the ISO. So there is a time and place for it. And that's the way with the a lot of the camera settings. You just got to know what situation you're going to change it in. But this way, auto ISO is working to our benefit. When it's dark, the camera is going to bump up the exposure using ISO. And when it's light, it's going to turn the ISO down so it's not as grainy. There are ways to set limits on our auto, auto ISO so it doesn't go over a certain point. And this is in the deep menu section if we come in. Right here, auto ISO speed settings, max for auto, 6400, and we can set a limit for that. So that is your lesson on exposure control or brightness control. We talked about the four different modes, how they're different, and how to change the brightness in each of those modes. And we even talked about auto ISO. Let me give you a quick run through on your exposure settings when we're shooting video. I've changed my video mode to be manual. I almost exclusively shoot in manual mode for video. There are some rare exceptions that I'll talk about on the crash course. Like if you're, if you're moving rapidly from bright to dark conditions, you'll probably need a little bit of help. The easiest way to think of this is to set this up from left to right. The first is we set our shutter speed and it should be twice of our frame rate inverted. So if we're shooting, you can see here that we're shooting at 30 frames per second, right? 30 frames per second, 29.97. So if I were to double that, that would be 1 60th of a second. I said that 1 60th of a second. Then I can come in, change my aperture to whatever I want it to be. In this case, I, my max opening is F4. And then at, in the final part of this, I, again, I don't like leaving it on auto for, you know, manual video shooting, I would come in and dial this to taste and that's how you would set it up. If I was shooting at 60 frames per second, I'd be at one 125th of a second and so on and so forth is you wanna double your frame rate, invert it, that's your shutter speed. Then you select your aperture and then you select your ISO to taste. You'll notice that because we're recording in 4K, we have a temperature indicator. So my guess is the camera will get hot. Again, I haven't done the test, so I don't know how long it'll last, hopefully not too long. Now, in addition to this, there is a high frame rate mode. If we were to come into the deep menu and we come down to high frame rate and we select enable, this is going to allow us to shoot at HD at 120 frames per second. Now, because we're shooting at 120 frames per second, we would need to change our shutter speed. So 120 times two is 240. So we need to be about about one 250th of a second. You can see it's getting dark because we're using a faster shutter speed. We like F4. 
We're going to need to bump this up a little bit. Now, I want to show you something else. If you're very keen to observe, is we're starting to see some banding artifacts, these lines going up. What's happening here is I am shooting in, in my room with an LED light, and LED lights flicker. So as we start to use faster and faster shutter speeds in flickering lights, we begin to see this banding problem, right? So if I were to, let's do this, come over and use an even faster shutter speed, and I'm gonna bump up the ISO here so you can see it even better. There it is. So if you were to see this while you're shooting video, unfortunately, the only way around it is to use a longer shutter speed. So we would have to come in, go back down to like 1 25th. Let's turn our ISO down so we can see what's going on. And you can see that it's gone away. 1 125th of a second if, you, if you're shooting in LED lights is, is what you have to aim for. I'm going to jump into the deep menu and turn this off. High frame rate mode is a lot of fun. I will be giving some demonstrations at a gym where we're going and we're working out and I will show you how to take slow motion video. It is a lot of fun when you put it to music and it's a great powerful tool and we have it in full HD at 120 frames per second. It's very awesome. But again, I'm gonna save that for the crash course. Now there are a couple other modes that we see up on the mode dial. We have our creative filters, we have our scenes. And, and again, we talked about the creative filters. If you wanna come in here and take a look at them, you can. I'm touching in the upper left-hand corner and you, it can kind of give you a preview of what you can expect. Not really what I consider to be professional tools, but some of the, this is fun. The miniature effect is pretty cool. You get your toy camera. You have HDR looks. I think the, it kind of depends with the HDR stuff of whether or not it looks great, but it's something to take a look at at some point, just so you know what they are and what they do. If we continue to rotate this, we get something called the scene modes. And what Canon is trying to do, and what I've seen them do many times over the years, is to try to make the cameras easier to use. So in the scene modes, essentially what happens is you choose what you're doing and the camera is going to do all the other settings. So if I'm shooting a portrait, I would choose portrait. But what you'll notice is we have no ability to change the shutter speed or the aperture or the ISO. The camera is, is, has locked us out. And this is the same if we were to do any of these options. You know, if we were to do sports, now it's saying one one thousandth of a second. There's nothing you can change. And again, you didn't buy this camera for that purpose is to be locked out of the controls. This is a fun technique we'll demonstrate on the crash course. You can do anything you want in any of these settings if you know how to control the exposure. And so it's not a mystery, you know, silent shutter. But these are all tools you can get elsewhere in the camera. So I don't spend a lot of time talking about these. We've got a self portrait mode, fun. There's also an automatic video record mode, but the ones that you should really worry about are the ones we discussed. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our mode dial and how to change your exposure settings. Before we jump into the lesson, what I want you to do is to make sure that your camera, the focusing square that you're using, we're gonna press the, the cluster button just to set this up. And we're gonna make sure that our tracking info is set like this. It's kind of confusing because that button is going to tell us what we want to do, not what it is. So if you set it up, if it's set up the wrong way, you might get frustrated. So if you wanna turn it off, this is saying if you wanna turn it off, press this. Just keep that in mind. And I'm gonna to go to my cluster button and I'm just going to make sure that that's turned off for now. That deals with, deals with tracking, we'll talk about it in a moment. You could also turn it off from that monitor when you see that box. Something I tell all of my students when they start to learn focusing is to break it down into three words, how, when, and where. If you think of focusing as how it focuses, when it focuses, and where it focuses, this is going to be simple. If you ignore that and try to learn through trial and error, it's gonna be a nightmare. When we're talking about engaging the camera's focusing systems, the most common way you're going to do it on your R50 is with a halfway shutter button depression. And the way it works is it's looking for an area of contrast. Push a shutter button halfway down, not all the way down, halfway down, and feel that spongy re resistance point. When it detects some 
contrast in the frame, it should show a focus box on here, depending on what focusing cluster you're using. We'll talk about that in just a second. When you push the shutter button down all the way, it's going to take the picture. So how do we focus with our camera? We focus with a halfway shutter button depression. And I'll be making some notes about using the touchpad to focus as we're looking through the EVF a little bit later. So the next question is, when does the camera focus? So if you remember, there was a feature in here called the focusing modes in on this screen. It's right here where it will say something like one shot or AI servo or AI focus. One shot means that the camera is going to focus one time to achieve focusing lock. So when I push a shutter button halfway down and I hold the shutter button halfway down, if I move the camera, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a little green screen square there, right there. That focus will remain locked. So when we're talking about when one shot it's focus one time. And as long as you're holding that shutter button halfway down, the focus will remain locked. This is referred to as recomposition. You are recomposing, you're getting a focusing lock and you're recomposing to make the subject more aesthetically pleasing in the frame of the monitor. This was a lot more common back in the day before we had eye detection, but it still is, is pretty handy today when you want to get a quick focus lock and recompose, it's something that every good photographer will know how to do. In one shot, you'll also notice we hear a beep. That beep is indicating the camera has achieved focus lock. One shot is ideal for taking pictures of subjects that do not move. We're talking about cooperating humans, maybe buildings, maybe you're shooting some landscapes, small children, not so much because small children love to run around all the time, right? So if we come back to our focusing modes, there's another one in here called servo. We're gonna select that. Now servo mode is a little bit different because when I push the shutter button halfway down, I don't get a beep, I don't see a green square, I see a blue square. And as I hold this halfway down and move the camera, that blue square is staying locked onto our little target here. Servo means that the camera is going to focus over and over and over again. It's a repeated focus as long as focusing is engaged. AI servo is ideal for shooting sports, fast moving subjects, small kids who are running around like crazy. Servo is where you're going to want to go when, you, when you're dealing with motion, birds in flight, maybe athletics, sports, all of those things. So one shot focuses one time, servo focuses over and over and over again. Now, many of you were keen to notice that there's a third option in here, AI focus. I almost never use it, but AI focus is a hybrid between the two. We're telling the camera to make the decision between what it thinks is a still subject and what is a moving subject. Now, the reason why I don't use this is because I used to try to use it back in the day, but it was unpredictable enough for me to not want to. And I, I would just end up just shooting in servo. Servo works fine for still subjects. You just don't get that complete focus lock. And it depends on what kind of shooting you're doing. But when we're talking about the win, we have one shot, which is a one-time focus, servo, which is a repeated focus, and AI focus, which is a hybrid of the two. We could also locate, all right, jump out of this, and go back to one shot. We can also locate the focusing modes in our black quick screen. Come here, they're right here on the bottom. Multiple places to find this. Also in the deep menu, you can find a lot of settings in regards to focusing. So we have talked about the how the camera focuses. We've talked about the when the camera focuses, and now we're about to talk about the where. The where deals with selecting focusing clusters and then determining where those focusing clusters are looking. We're going to direct the camera to look in specific areas of the frame for areas of contrast. The way we access our focusing clusters by default is this button right here, the cluster button. And once I press this, you'll see here on the bottom, it says ISO, press the ISO button for our autofocus clusters, right? Here they are on the bottom. There's a bunch of them and, and some of them are customizable, very powerful. These deal with different shapes and sizes. So when we go to spot autofocus, you can see we have this little square. It's a little white square, right? Small focusing square. 
push your cluster button, press ISO. The next one is one point AF. It's a little bit larger. This is really my general purpose go-to focusing square. I use it a lot just for general purpose types of work. Spot AF is really better for th things like macro photography when you're trying to be really precise. The third one is expanded area autofocus. You can see we got our one square with four additional squares. And what's happening is we're giving the camera permission to look just outside that box to find an area of contrast. Pushing the cluster button, ISO button again. Then we have our expand AF area around. We get more boxes, a little bit greater area. This one's great for shooting sports. I use it all the time on sports shooting, birds in flight, things of that nature. I'm gonna press the cluster button, I'm gonna press ISO button. Then we come to the flexible zones. And the thing that is really cool about these is that we can determine the shapes of these guys. So the flexible zone AF1 starts off as a square, two starts off as a horizontal column, and then we get like a vertical row. But something you'll notice is that if we press our cluster button again, we're given the option to change the shape of these guys. This is super powerful because it allows us to customize and control specifically how big we want these flexible zones. Birds in flight, if you want to keep them, you know, in the middle of the frame, it might be something like that, just depending on what you're doing. So the flexible zones are customizable. I'm going to press OK. And then finally, we have the whole area AF. This is actually pretty useful when we're doing things like face detection or eye detection with a, with a person because the camera knows how to look for an eye and to jump on the focus of it. I'll demonstrate it in just a moment. So if I was you know, giving a recommendation to somebody who, who's doing a portrait for the first time, I would probably say, you know what? Try this whole area AF with eye detection. Why? Because when you're shooting people, you want the eye, at least one eye, if not both, to be in focus. If the eye isn't in focus and you're not going for something abstract, it's not gonna look very good. So there's, there's different times and different strategies to choose these focusing squares. And this is one of the big benefits of the crash course is because I'll show you when you're doing di different genres of photography or videography, I'm gonna use this square and this is how I'm using it and this is why. So you'll have to know how to change those squares in those situations depending on the type of work that you're doing. So something that's quite annoying when you're doing this is, is if you have it set to whole area AF, and you try to tap on our touch monitor, it's going to kick us into the tracking mode, which is a little weird. The tracking mode, typically we can activate when you see this box and it says off, we can turn it off, but when we press the screen again, now it jumps back in. The idea of tracking is that as we move the camera, the camera will keep the focusing box on that subject. This is gonna work best with things like servo, right? Because Servo is for moving subjects, right? Turn it on here. And so then we get this tracking ability to follow a subject as, as it's moving and the camera will update the focus over and over again as we're holding the shutter button halfway down. Tracking is great when we have a single subject on a contrast-free background. In some cases, it may be something like a bird in flight or somebody running. But if you're shooting team sports and you got 22 people running around on a field, the camera can be easily tricked. So again, it really depends on the type of sport that you're shooting, but tracking means is that we're telling the camera to follow whatever we get an initial focus lock on and we can continue to shoot, right? We're not on a burst mode. Let's, let's do it with a burst mode here. And this is what it looks like. Now, something that's a little quirky about this is that when we are in the whole area AF, anytime we touch on the screen, it's going to jump back into that tracking mode. Even if we turn it off, here it comes, jumping back into the tracking mode. It's a little annoying, right? So we're gonna turn that off by coming in to our focusing cluster, ISO, and let's just go with a regular focusing point. So now when we touch on the monitor, we can move the focusing square just by touching on it and telling the camera where we want it to look for something of contrast. So this is how we can move the where we touch on the back monitor. And there's some other ways to do this when we're looking through the viewfinder that I'll talk about a little bit later. So we've talked about the how, we have talked about 
the when, and we have talked about the where the camera is focusing, how, when, and where, and that is the foundation of learning how to focus with your camera. Now, having said that, there are tons of other focusing features built into the camera that are extremely powerful that we'll go through real quick. There is an important side note about this autofocus manual focus switch right here. You can see that as I push it, nothing is happening. And the reason is I have an AF MF switch on the lens on my 24 to 105. So the rule on this is that if you have a lens switch that allows you to jump to manual, this will not work. It, I think it should work either way, but I guess this is the way Canon has it set up. If you're using something like the Nifty 50 that does not have a manual focus switch on the lens, then this will work. So I know a question that many of you are going to be asking is, Michael, we have this touch monitor. Why can't we use the touch monitor to engage the focusing? On the R50, it's set up a little bit differently than what we see on some other cameras. And I think this is how Canon wants us to do it, is we come into our autofocus tab and we see this preview AF. By default, this is probably going to be turned on, but I recommend turning it off because I'll demonstrate this in a second. So let's enable this so I can show you what's going on, is the idea here is that as I'm touching on the monitor in different places, the camera will begin to focus in that spot. So technically we can a little bit engage, it's struggling a little bit. We can engage focusing, let me change my focusing square. There it goes. So we might be able to get away with some touch focus stuff, but it doesn't work as well as engaging the focusing directly with a halfway shutter button depression. And another reason I'm not a huge fan of this is it means that whatever your camera's focusing squares on, it's going to be attempting to focus. So it's not even like a really good focus. It's like a, it's like a lukewarm focus. It's not perfect and it's not really locked in. So you won't hear a beep or anything. And it also drains your battery. It's constantly going to be focusing over and over and over again. So I just turn this off and then I engage focusing more intentionally with that halfway shutter button depression. So I hope that answers that question. So let's talk about manual focus and how it works. And I'm going to flip the lens switch from AF to MF. The moment I do that, you can see that we get this range bar. It's in meters here. And it's telling us that we're focused just over one meter with this little tick mark right here. So if I come up and I start rotating my focusing ring, you can see that it's telling me where that focal plane is shifting to. And it also tells us the direction that we're focusing. Those little arrows further away is counterclockwise, closer is clockwise. One of the most powerful manual focusing tools that I think is available that every sh everybody should know this is the manual zoom focusing technique. So the way we do this is we use this magnifying glass right here, and that will punch the zoom of our viewfinder closer. So we're at 5x. If I was to push it again, now we're at 10x. And we can see very closely this target, and it makes it super easy that when I start rotating the focusing wheel, I can see the moment it gets into tack sharp focus. And there are reasons we want to do this, especially when we're shooting video where we do not want the focusing to change. We want it to stay locked. And then once we've done that, press the magnifying feature again, and we're zoomed out. Now, if we were to start shooting, the focus would not change. So depth of field starts coming into play and some other considerations. But suffice to say, if you're going for a manual focus and you don't want it to change, use this technique. Let's start talking a little bit about eye and face detection. I'm still on manual focus, so I, I want to turn this back on to autofocus that disappears. We have this model helping us out, handsome guy. We're going to go into our focusing clusters. And to demonstrate this, we'll use the whole area AF. So you can see that the moment I do this, there's a little four corner box that jumps onto my right eye as, as we're facing the camera. And anywhere that I move the camera, it follows it. So the idea on this is that when eye detection is turned on in that whole area AF mode, it recognizes a human face, it locks on to that eye. So when we push a shutter button halfway down, 
we're in servo mode, we can see that blue box is getting dialed in. Something that's pretty cool about this is that as we zoom in, you can see it stays with it. And the same is true as we zoom out. However, this is real estate dependent. So when the face gets small enough, you will not see eye detection working as well. And it can get pretty small. It's actually very impressive. It's been improved over the years. But suffice it to say that if you're shooting a portrait, especially at a wide aperture like 1.8, and you have a very shallow depth of field, this is an absolute lifesaver. As somebody who shot weddings without eye detection, you're constantly moving the squares around. This is a total game changer because you get a higher number of keepers, which means you don't have to take as many shots if you don't need to. It increases your workflow speed. Most wedding ph photographers today have these tools built into their cameras, and it, it's really quite efficient and powerful. So the question may be is, how do I turn this off if I don't want it? Well, you can come into your quick menu. If you remember over here on the left side, we had this guy right here, auto. And this is where we can determine whether this is working or not. Auto means we're gonna let the camera decide whether it's a human, animal, or car. Humans are a little easier because our faces are more consistent. We're animals, you have tens of thousands of different species and all of their faces are different. So it's not quite as good on animals yet, but if you're shooting, you know, a lizard or a snake, you know, or a cat, the cameras are it's, it's really doing an amazing job at finding out where that eye is, and it's just going to continue to get better. If you're dealing with vehicles, then it's looking at the cockpit usually and tracking from there. Spot detection, we can enable it or disable it. But this is where we determine the type of subject we want eye detection or face detection, or we can turn it off completely. So when I turn it off completely and come back to this, now we're just dealing with our whole area AF. It's finding areas of contrast and it's focusing on that. If we wanna turn it back on, we're gonna come in here, we'll go face detection for humans, and there it is. Now there are some additional tweaks on this in the deep menu I need to show you. So when we come into the deep menu, it's like you're gonna use like 20% of this stuff more than everything else. The, this purple tab right here, deals with the focusing settings. There's a lot of focusing settings in here. We, we can change the focusing mode. We can change our focusing cluster. We can change our tracking, which I demonstrated how to change with the uh, cluster button. We can change the subject to detect, and we can even enable eye detection, right? Right here. So if we turn eye detection off and we come back out and we go to detect humans, now this is changed from eye detection to face detection. You'll notice that we don't have that little box on the right eye. We have this box that's kind of staying with my face. And as I move the camera around, push the shutter button halfway down, we can engage focusing. Now, something that you'll notice is that when you get two faces in here, you'll get a little white arrow, or you should get a little white arrow appearing that will allow you to determine which of the two faces you want to focus on or you can also just touch on the screen. Just touch on the screen like this and say, hey, I wanna focus on this face. Something that's cool is that face detection does work with some of the other clusters. So if we come into the cluster modes, and let's just go to spot AF, you'll notice that when we put that spot AF over our target, it can tell if there's a face in there or not. If I'm shooting towards the target, it just jumps into regular focusing. But if I shoot at a face, boom, it's there. And you can see those squares are present darkly. It's like they're gray or something, right? And then we can engage it. This kind of shooting is very useful when you're shooting in groups and you want to direct your focusing towards a specific person. Maybe it's your kid at a birthday party, right? We can also come back in, engage eye detection again, and now we're at eye detection. See that? I'm not gonna do this with all of the focusing modes, but you can see it'll do it as I change through these clusters. Is it doing it with all? Yeah, looks like it's gonna do it with all of them. So just keep that in mind that as we change our focusing clusters, if we have eye or face detection turned on, it is going to work with those clusters. Obviously it would not work with manual focus. But now we're going to come in and talk about some of these guys in here, very powerful stuff. The first we're gonna talk about manual peaking settings. I'm gonna turn this on 
and we're going to select red and high. Peaking focus only works in manual focus. So once we have peaking turned on and I flip the lens switch from AF to MF, you'll notice that we get this red overlay. And the way that peaking works is that the camera will put a color overlay on areas of high contrast. And it allows us to use our manual focus ring more accurately when we're zoomed out. Now, this the, one of the drawbacks is that when we zoom in, it disappears. So this is only going to work when you're fully zoomed out. But when I'm doing video shoots and I need a quick indicator, this is a tool that I will sometimes use. I, I still also use the zoom as well. But you can come in and even change the color. You can change the intensity. If you wanted to see yellow, you can see this fine yellow outline. And that is the peaking setting. I'm going to come in, turn this to off. There is another tool referred to as the focusing guide. Again, this is something that's only going to work in manual focus. If you see there is a box in these three little tick marks, it's looking for some contrast. So let's get it out of focus. Let's change it. And you'll see these triangles here. There's one on the top and there's two on the sides like this. So that as we get more and more out of focus, they get further and further apart. But as we get closer and closer, eventually they will turn green. And it's essentially telling us that the subject matter in this box is at its highest contrast and you're focusing there. I don't use this one as much, but it's still a tool in the toolbox. Come in and turn this to off. Which brings us to our touch and drag autofocus settings. Super powerful, a little bit harder to demonstrate because it works as you're looking through the viewfinder. The idea on this is that we're going to turn the back monitor into a touchpad that will allow us to, to direct focusing. The first thing we want to do is turn this on. And then we're going to come down to the positioning method, relative or absolute. And then we're going to come down to active touch area. The idea on this is that when you look at these different options, Anything in white is what will be activated as you look through the viewfinder. This is also going to matter depending on which of your eyes is dominant. I am left eye dominant. My left eye is here, which means my nose is here, and my nose will bump into the screen. If you're right eye dominant, your nose is going to be over here. And so you can use this right side of the panel. You can use all of the panel if you don't have a big nose like me. Or you can use, use these different shapes. So let's just, for the sake of this example, say that we're right eye dominant, our nose is over here. So if our nose bumps here, nothing's going to happen. But we can use this part of the screen as we're looking through the viewfinder to change the focusing square. We'd also have to be in regular focus. So you'd be looking through the viewfinder and you would be able to come in and direct where the focusing square is going. Very powerful when you're shooting sports because you'll need a quick way to change where that focusing square is going. We don't have a joystick. Typically, a lot of cameras have joysticks and we can use that to direct focus. So you can use your touchpad as essentially a joystick. So we also have this feature in here that says tap to select subject to detect. If this is turned on and you're using eye or face detection and you tap on a subject, then it will jump into that face or eye detection as you're looking through the viewfinder. So those are your touch and drag autofocus settings. Coming back out, and real quick, some of you are probably wondering about this setting. Essentially, it is the relationship of manual focus to autofocus. By default, it's on disable after one shot. So if you're doing one shot, you get your focus. Now let's just turn it to one shot real quick. We'll jump in, go to one shot. So the idea on this is that once we get our focusing lock, what can we do manually? And in this mode, it's turned off. However, if we wanted to do something like a manual focus after we got a one shot, we would set it here. So I'm going to get focus lock. Let me tap the share button, come back out. I get focus. And, and so the idea is that you hold the shutter button halfway down, and then you can engage your focusing ring as you're holding it down. There's certain types of macro photographers who would want to do this. So they would get a focusing lock, 
and then they would tweak the focus just a little bit. We can take this a step further by having it magnify when we do this. So we get our focusing lock and it punches in. Very nice, very cool. Again, product and macro photographers, certain types of landscape photographers would definitely be using that. So I thought it would be worth taking some time to talk about focusing modes while we are in video mode. Obviously, if we flip our lens switch to manual focus, or if we don't have a lens with the lens switch, we would push it over here. In manual focus, the focus will not change. In most Hollywood movies, there's somebody called a first camera assistant, and his main job is to control the focus. Sometimes he'll do it, you know, sitting or standing directly next to the camera and moving the focusing ring. Sometimes he'll do it by remote control. He'll use a device that has gears and motors that will turn these rings. And it shocks people to know that most movies are, or at least up until recently, were mostly shot with manual focus. And the reason is you've put in all this work and sets and actors and lighting. You don't want the focus changing when you don't want it to. You want to have control over that. So as a starting base, learn to use manual focus. Learn to use some of the techniques we already discussed. For example, peaking. So peaking is very handy when we are talking about video shooting. So if we were to come in here, now we have a tool that we can see where the focus is relatively quickly. We also had that tool of jumping in if we wanted to use our manual zoom technique, another tool. Same thing in video. We know how to manually focus, but what are some of the tools available to us in terms of autofocus? I'm gonna go back to autofocus. And this guy right here, Servo AF, is telling the camera to focus and refocus over and over again. Now in this exact instance, I have face detection. So if you're going to be doing something like vlogging and you're going to appear in front of the camera, especially if you're gonna be moving around a lot, this is what you want to be set up with. Go with Servo AF, have your face detection turned on. In this case, it's eye detection. If we wanted to turn that off, we would come to our subject to detect and we could turn it off. And now what we've done is we're just telling the camera See what happens when we come into our focusing squares. So we've turned off face detection. And the camera is basically looking for areas of contrast with servo AF. So we can change this by again coming into our focusing clusters. Remember how, when, and where. Let me back up a little bit, just a little bit on this. Yeah, so we could turn it off. And now the camera is just looking for areas of contrast with its particular focusing cluster that it's using. So you can see that as I'm changing what we're looking at, the camera is changing its focus because we have servo AF on. So in this case, the how is the servo AF. It's constantly focusing over and over and over again. Now we can get a little bit more specific with this by changing the focusing cluster we're using. We press the cluster button, pressing my ISO button. So on the whole area AF, it's just looking for an area of contrast. But what happens when we go to something like one point AF? Now we have this focusing square. Come back out. So this allows us to rack or pull focus using the touch monitor. I can touch on the target. We're focusing on there. I can touch on our model. He's focusing on there. And it has gotten so smooth and good over the last few years is that it's put some bit, some biz, some companies have gone out of business that used to sell the rack gears and wheels and all this stuff. It's not needed anymore because Canon cameras are so good at pulling focus with the touch monitor. This is a very powerful technique that I'll spend a little bit more time on in the crash course. Typically this is used, you see it all the time in Hollywood where they're trying to direct your focus to a particular subject in the frame. Now, what if we didn't want the servo AF engaged all the time? Well, we could turn that off, we could pause it, and what you'll notice is that we can still move this box around, but then we would have to push the shutter button to get it to actually focus. So we have that ability to turn servo AF off. 
And again, if we wanted to turn it back on and if we wanted to go back with our human detection, there it is. Tap over here. So there's a lot of very powerful combinations when we're talking about video. It really depends on what you're trying to do. But just keep in mind, you want when you have people on the frame, you typically want their eyes in focus. So that's a quick introduction to focusing when we are shooting video. To give some more added value in this lesson, I want to talk about button customizations, how you can find it, and how to navigate it. In the past, typically you, you could come in, let's go to manual mode. You could push your info button, come into the black screen, hit the Q button here, and you would see it in here. It's not in here, it's in the deep menu. So you have to come in to our orange tab. If you're enjoying this lesson and you would like to see an introduction to the deep menu system, hit that like button, because if there's a lot of interest and I know it's worth my time, I typically do it, but I spend a lot more time on this in the crash course where I go through every menu item and tell you what it is, how it works and my recommendations. So in here in the orange tab, when we find customized buttons, we can select this and we get an overlay of the camera. And then the button that we want to customize is in white. So as we scroll through these different buttons, we can control how their functions change. In the beginning, I would say, don't mess with this until you get some, some of the basics understood in, in their second nature. But eventually what will happen is there will come a time that you're, you're going to want to customize some of these buttons to, you know, turn, for example, turn eye detection on or off quickly. So let's say, for example, we wanted to customize our directional pad down as we're shooting. If we press the set button, it will allow us to get access to tons of different features so we don't have to go through menus. For example, if we wanted to just jump between one shot and servo, we could select this. I'm going to come back out. I go to AV mode and now I could just press down if I wanted to jump between one shot and servo. So those shortcuts will really come into play as you get more and more advanced. And I would say, take a look at this at some point, understand how this works. It's interesting that we don't have an AF on button here. Yeah, it turns AF off, but we don't have an AF on button. Sometimes Can Canon will do this is they'll limit some of the customizations on, on some of the more affordable models because they want us to upgrade. But this is how we can customize our camera in different ways. Another part of this customization is that we have the ability to customize the control ring of our lens, meaning this guy on the front of most RF lenses, we can control it to do different things. In this case, it says if I push my shutter button halfway down and I rotate it, I should be able to control my exposure compensation directly. It's kind of nice, right? But what if I don't want to do it that way? What if I want, want to use this for something else? I would come in here, select this box, and it gives us a number of options. I have a friend who uses it to change his white balance selection. Go figure. But it's really another way to customize the camera. Real quick, let's talk about our drive modes. You can access the drive modes by pushing to the right of your directional pad. The drive modes tell the camera what to do after we push a shutter button down all the way. Single shooting is a single frame. You push a shutter button down one, it takes one picture. High speed continuous burst is the highest frame rate possible. Something that's interesting about the R50 is it doesn't have a full mechanical shutter. The first part of the exposure is an electronic shutter. And then in the second part, we have a mechanical shutter at the end. So it's not a full traditional mechanical shutter. It doesn't have the ability. But having said that, most of your images are going to be fine when you shoot with that first shutter curtain electronic. If you're shooting full electronic and you're panning or you're dealing with moving subjects, you can start to see the jello effect where you get warping and it doesn't really look good. So for most of the time, I recommend leaving it into the first shutter curtain electronic and that is capped out, I think it's 12 frames per second, and full electronic is 15 frames per second when we're shooting on this high-speed continuous. This high-speed continuous, you notice it doesn't have a plus. This is a little bit slower at 7.6 frames per second with the first shutter curtain electronic. I think it's 15 frames per second electronic, so these electronically are the same. And then we go down to three frames per second for shutter curtain electronic, and then I think it's five frames per second with pure electronic. Then you can you can hear the difference. So if we come in here, listen. 
So not as fast, right? These last three all deal with timers. The first is the 10 second timer, popular for you know family portraits. We've done this all <laughs> so many times for Christmases and get togethers with my family. Obviously I set my camera up, hit the timer and I'm running out there to jump in the, in, you know, in the frame with everybody. Two second timer is a little bit shorter. I use this a lot for the camera tests that I do, two second timer. And then we have self timer continuous. This is a 10 second timer that allows us to tell the camera how many shots we want it to take. So it could be, let's say we wanted six images because you're worried about people blinking. We have our light turning on. I know it's kind of hard to see. As a timer, you can see it flickering. It gets close to shooting, it gets faster. And it takes the six images just like that. Boom, 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 boom. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the drive mode. It's what the camera does after we push a shutter button down all the way. Let's talk about our camera's white balance. To access it, we can always jump into the Q menu and we're gonna go into white balance right here. So the short answer on this is if you're just getting started, leave it on auto white balance. The longer answer on this is that as you shoot, you're going to notice your picture's color is going to look a little bit off. And when it starts looking off, you're going to want to set your white balance icon to the type of situation you're shooting it. So we have all these little icons on the bottom. If I was shooting outside and it was sunny, I would put on the sun icon. If I was shooting in the shade, I would put it on the shade icon. If I was shooting under clouds, it'd be the cloud icon. And you notice the color is changing as I'm shifting these. Look at tungsten light, how blue it is. If I was shooting in white fluorescent light, I would choose this guy. If I was shooting with a strobe, I would choose this guy. We also have the ability to change into custom white balance. I'll show you this in a second, as well as Kelvin white balance. So to give you a little bit more of the theory behind it is that our eyes are very sophisticated, far more than whatever a camera sensor can do. And our eyes adjust to the temperatures of light that we're in. So when you walk from outdoors to indoors, you don't see a color shift. Our, our eyes adjust automatically. Cameras cannot do that. Cameras pick up these color differences depending on the source of the light. So for example, the sun on a sunny day, it gives off a very different color than something like, I don't know, a tungsten light. So this allows us to tell the camera, to give it a clue in terms of what type of environment we are in so it can make the adjustment. White, white balance, regular white balance, it really tries to do it on its own. It typically does a pretty good job 80% of the time, 80, 85% of the time it's pretty good. But every once in a while, when you get into like mixed lighting situations, it really screws up. It can, it can really, because it's just confused, right? We can even choose the priority between an ambient priority or a white priority, a slight shift of how it's auto white balance. You want it to be more white or maybe a little bit more like your ambient light. We also have the ability to shift and bracket our white balance. I do not recommend playing with this because if you change this and you're, you don't remember, it's gonna make your life hard. Come back out. But I wanna demonstrate what to do in mixed lighting conditions where you might have a tungsten light with a fluorescent light and maybe you're in the shade too all at the same time. That would be the time to do a custom white balance. So the way we do this is we're gonna press menu. It says shoot to set white balance. See, it gives us this one shot. It gives us the custom white balance icon. And the idea on this is that we're telling the camera what is white in the situation we're shooting in. Take a picture. It's giving me some information. And we should be good to go. If we're set on the custom icon, yeah, we, we are good to go. So now the camera is using a custom white balance. This is like a perfect even white because I just shot in this environment. When I was shooting weddings, I would do this sometimes with bride's dresses because it was the only thing you know at the reception that was white or maybe a ceiling or a wall just because my color was off and you know I, I wanted to try to get it right in camera you know, if it was a reception or, or, or whatever. But if we go even deeper into the theory, the best way to learn about white balance is this Kelvin. Kelvin is a scientific metric used by scientists to describe the color of light. 
and it is an actual temperature. It's getting into the theory of it. It's very complex. They use something called a black box. And the idea is how much that black box radiates certain shades as it gets warmer. That's how it works. But without going into that, let's set our color temperature. Daylight is typically regarded 51 to 5200. I'm shooting in daylight LEDs right now. And I want you to see what happens as we turn the color temperature down. What happens to the monitor? Oh my goodness, it's turning blue. A color temperature light source that is low would be something like candlelight. Candlelight is very yellow. We can even see that with, with the naked eye. So what in the world is going, why is this blue if candlelight is yellow? Well, what's happening is we are adding the opposite of the yellow candlelight to even it out. This is the heart of the matter when we're talking about white balance. If we were to go in the opposite direction, higher than 5100, you'll notice that those white blinds are now turning very, very orange. And I like to think of this in terms of blow torches. Blow torches are really, really hot, right? And they're also blue. So if you're in a room full of blue blow torches, we could set the Kelvin temperature to 9,000 and the camera would add this orange light to balance it out. So blue and yellowish are kind of opposites in regards to white balance. And this is what's happening when we, we do any of the white balance control is the camera is adding different amounts of light based on the color temperature that we're shooting in to try to correct it, to compensate for it. I know that's a lot of information, some students don't like me going into that. They say it's very confusing. And if that's too confusing, suffice it to say, 5100 is daylight balance. And if you're really confused, shoot on auto white balance. And for the most part, you'll be good to go. And then at some point, you'll get frustrated and remember this lesson and come back to it and watch it again. So real quick, let's talk about our metering modes. I've put a, a light on a tripod over there to demonstrate what's going on. I'm going to come into my quick menu and I'm going to select metering modes. The easiest way for me to explain this is to talk about the spot metering mode first. When I select the spot metering mode, you'll notice we have a circle here in the middle of the frame. And if I tap the shutter button, not at the light, but away from the light, it's giving me a shutter speed of 1 80th of a second. Now, what I want you to watch is what happens is when that circle goes over the bright light, the frame gets darker. And it's using a much faster shutter speed. But if I come back over here, so what's happening is we're telling the camera where, in terms of a physical location, where to sample light from. If you remember when I was doing that hand thing in front of the camera, this is where we get to tell the camera which shapes of the viewfinder to, to use. And in the spot metering mode, we're using a very tight circle that you can see it changes a little bit as we get closer, but it really doesn't go nuts until we're right here. The image turns dark because the camera is saying if you want to expose for that light, you have to use a very fast shutter speed. And the moment we get away from it, we're back to a normal shutter, you know, a lower shutter speed because it's sampling the blinds behind it. It's not looking at the light. So another way to look at this is if we were to go with something like a center weighted. And we don't get a circle here, but we get a, an area in the center it's a little bit larger. You can see the camera is gradually changing to a faster shutter speed. If we were to change it again to partial metering mode, it gets even wider. Let's see about how much it gives us here. It's a little bit bigger than spot metering mode. And if we were to change it again to evaluative metering mode, and this is the one that's pretty much by default, it breaks the, the viewfinder up into different chunks with a higher emphasis on the middle, but still kind of balances everything. It's kind of looking at the whole frame. Can't really get that one four thousandth of a second. It's looking at everything. In the beginning, what I'd recommend is just sticking with your evaluative meeting, metering mode. But if you're, if you're shooting portraits into heavy backlight, you might want to go with your spot metering mode or maybe even your partial metering mode. But essentially, the metering modes allow us to designate the shapes the camera will use to measure light coming into the camera. Let me give you some gear and lens recommendations. Now, we've already talked about memory cards. I'm a big fan of the SanDisk Extreme Pros, as I've already pointed out. 
In regards to batteries, I like the original manufacturer batteries. There's tons of knockoff battery brands out there. I don't recommend them because sometimes there are problems with them. They don't work as well. Sometimes they blow up or catch on fire. There's things like that going on. If you bought a really nice camera, it just makes sense to buy good batteries for it. If this is your first camera, you probably don't have a tripod yet. It's probably the best first piece of gear that you should get. Your tripod is going to allow you to put your camera in places that where you don't have to hold it, especially if you're in front of the camera or if you're doing anything with video work, uh, landscape photography, long exposures, tripods have a multitude of uses and purposes. I personally prefer the carbon fiber legs. They're more expensive and the nice ones can run as much as four or $500. But Bogan Manfrotto and some other manufacturers make some decent aluminum travel ones that you could probably get less than 200. It's important to invest into your tripod. You don't want to go and buy that Walmart tripod for $50 because they will break over time. If you had to do it and you had nothing else, Sure, but a tripod is an investment you're going to want to last for you know five to 10 years. And that's why I like the carbon fiber Bogan Monfrados. If you are looking to save as much money as possible or you're coming from an existing Canon EF mount, you really can't do better than the EF to RF adapter. The basic mount costs $100. This device is very special because it'll allow you to use some of the older Canon EF lenses on your new RF mount. The, mirror, the new mirrorless mount is referred to as RF. So anytime you're looking at lenses, make sure that you, you notice whether it says EF or RF. The RF are the newer lenses. Those are the ones you're going to want to get. At some point, you are going to need to get yourself a set of filters, especially if you are a landscape photographer, if you do video work, if you're doing a lot of strobe work for portraits, or you want to get creative with long exposures, you will need a set of ND filters, and especially for landscape photographers, you'll need a polarizer. I can make a great recommendation, and that is of the Maven magnetic filter line. We also have a threaded line called the Maven High Standard. Either of those are available in the link in my descriptions. You can get a whole set of Maven filters for a very affordable price, and they have a lifetime warranty. In my opinion, they are the best out there. Now, if you get into video work, you're going to need to invest into a microphone because the microphone on the camera doesn't really work that great. As you're handling the camera, as you're changing the zoom, you're going to hear it in the camera. It, it just picks up a lot of the noise and vibrations. It's not a really high quality one. There are two different microphones that I recommend. If you're just getting started and you need a general purpose microphone, I would say get the Maven mic. And that's sold on our website as well as Amazon. We put that through a battery of tests and it was the winner among the most popular brands when we were designing it. It's affordable, it's like 50 bucks. Many of you will be tempted to go out and buy the Rode microphone. It's a $300 microphone and probably a little bit more than what you need for a general purpose mic. If you are doing on-camera work like this, I would strongly recommend a lavalier mic. And I'm wearing Countryman. It's kind of expensive, but it's a really good mic. And then you'll need a transmitter and a receiver pack. In the past, I typically stuck with the Sennheiser E100 series. Very reliable, very high quality audio. But I have also recently tried the new DJI mic. It is a really incredible pack. It allows you to record two voices into the same transmitter. Really nice microphone set. I also highly recommend that if you're looking for a lab set, very affordable. You basically have a backup or you can do two people at once. Really awesome. Let's talk about lenses. For the new R mount for Canon, we have the 18 to 45. I'm not really a huge fan of that simply because it's a very small lens and you're very limited in your focal length range. The kit lens I would recommend over that is the 18 to 150. That is going to be a tremendous walk around lens where you're, you're going, to, going to cover a much wider focal length from wide, wider angles to more telephoto photos. You know, if you had one lens, that's probably for portability and versatility outside the one you're going to want to get. Now, I get a lot of questions about wide angle lenses for the APS-C mirrorless. And this is going to be a strange recommendation, but I highly recommend Canon's EF 10 to 18. That was really designed for the EF mounts, but it's a very wide angle lens. And if you adapt it over, you can get a great wide angle. Brand new, last time I checked, it was about 300, but you can find them used sometime like 150. So it's a really affordable wide angle lens solution. If you're looking for something a little bit more telephoto, definitely take a look at the 100 to 400 RF. I have purchased two of them. 
One of them we used on a Safari. It was fantastic. That is a home run lens. If you believe at some point that you'll be getting into full frame, which is the size of the sensor, and you want to go ahead and invest into full frame lenses, the ones I recommend to start off with are the 24 to 105 f4. It's amazing. It's an incredible starter lens. The 70 to 200, and there's also the 100 to 500 RFs. They're all outstanding, but they're also pretty expensive. If you found this video helpful and you're ready to take it to the next level, you are definitely going to be interested in our crash course. Take a look at the link in the description. It'll take you to my blog. If you leave your name and your email address, we will reach out to you as soon as it's ready. Again, thank you so much for joining me on this tutorial of your Canon R50. Have a great day and I'll see you next time.